what I want to do in this video is talk about the very popular concept of, of time dilation, which is the phenomenon where a clock that is moving, according to special relativity, will appear to run slower than a clock that's at rest. And we're actually going to go through the derivation for, for how much the clock slows down. And though there's going to be a little bit of math in it, don't worry, it's, it's actually a fairly simple derivation and will only take about three lines. So don't get scared away by that. So the first thing that we want to do is come up with a basic idea for a clock that we're going to use. And we're going to do this by considering two mirrors and a beam of light which is bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. So the light bounces back and forth, and every time it bounces from one side to the other side, we're going to say that's a time little t. So we're going to use that little t to correspond to how long it takes the beam of light to go from one mirror to the other in its own frame of reference. So this is uh, can be thought of as the reading on the moving clock. So the reading on moving clock. So now what we're going to do is we're going to say what happens if I take this clock and I'll say it's going to be moving in this direction with a certain velocity. Now just a quick note, the reason that we say we're going to have it move in this direction is so that it's perpendicular to the direction that the, that the light is originally bouncing back and forth that the separation of the mirrors are so we avoid a number of issues like uh, like length contraction that could make the make the derivation more more difficult uh, so we're just gonna avoid some of those issues well now the mirrors are gonna start here but as time goes on these mirrors are going to move to the right and the beam of light that's bouncing between these mirrors is instead of going just straight back and forth, it's going to go on an angled trajectory. So it's going to bounce there and going to bounce back there. And we want to know what is the amount of time capital T that it takes for the light in my frame of reference to bounce from one mirror to the other mirror. So this is uh, time past for me, for me watching watching this moving clock go by. So how are we going to do this? Well, we notice that if it takes, if I'm measuring an amount of time t for the light to go from here to here, then this length is going to be c times t. The speed of light is c, and it's moving for an amount of time capital T. So that's how that's the amount of time for that. Then we can also look at how far has the mirror moved in that same amount of time. Well, the mirror is moving at a velocity v, so and for an amount of time, capital T. So this is going to be a distance v times t. And this distance, the distance between the mirrors, is actually going to be the same as the distance between these two mirrors here. And if the speed of light is c in its own frame, and it's takes a time little t to bounce from one mirror to another. This is just going to be c times little t. And we notice that these three lengths form a right angle triangle. So how do we relate the lengths of three sides of a right angle triangle? Well, using the Pythagoras theorem that we, that we learned in high school. So we get ct squared plus v times capital T squared is equal to c times capital T squared. This is just Pythagoras theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, the hypotenuse squared. So we want to try to solve for capital T. So what we're going to do is take this term and bring it over to the other side of the equation and pull the t out of there. So this is going to give us on the left hand side c squared times t squared equals, uh, we're going to get a capital T squared times c squared, which comes from this term here, minus, since we're going to get a minus sign when we bring this over to the right hand side, 
minus v squared. And we can take this equation and divide both sides by c squared. So this is going to be c squared, so that just goes to 1. This is going to be c squared over c squared, so this is also going to go to 1. And this is going to be v squared over c squared. So if we want to solve for, for capital T, all we're going to get is capital T equals little t over the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And that is the special relativity formula for time dilation. This is how much time has passed for me. And this is how much time has passed on the moving clock. So time for moving clock. So if I say, how long does it take how long does it take for one second to appear to me? Well, I just put one in here. If I have a certain velocity for this, I, I can just plug it into there. I know, I know the value of C, and I can get a value for how long it appears one second for one second to take according to my clock. And I've made an Excel sheet that actually, uh, that actually has some of these values. So in this column, we have V over C, so you can think of this as the percentage of the speed of light that we're going. And this is the time capital T, the time it takes, how much time has elapsed for my clock when the moving clock has a reading of one second. So if I'm going at 10% uh, the speed of light, V over C equals 0.1, so I'm going at 10% the speed of light, then the time that's elapsed for me is 1.005 seconds. So that is not a very big difference, even going at 10% the speed of light. It's only a 0.5% difference. But if we go up to very high velocities, like 0.9% or 90% the speed of light, then when one second elapses on the moving clock, I'm going to have seen that 2.3 seconds has elapsed for me. And as I go up even higher, if I'm going at 99.99% the speed of light, it'll take 70 seconds for me to see the moving clock change by one second. So the moving clock is running much slower than my own clock. And uh, so you can actually just plug these in and, and do that to find out how fast these clocks move relative to each other. Now, there's uh, this has actually been tested. Uh, one, way that, one way that they've tested this is you can make something called a muon, which is a kind of subatomic particle. It's, it's like a heavy version of an electron. It's a subatomic particle like an electron, and it only lives for about 2.2 microseconds. So 2.2 millionths, if, I, if I'm remembering my units right, 2.2 millionths of a second is how long this lasts for. If it's moving slowly. But you can look at these, uh, you can make these in a particle accelerator and you can make them also move very quickly. And when they're moving quickly, you can measure how far they, they travel before they, before they decay and they'll make it much farther than they would, than this time would seem to allow them. So if they're moving, uh, they might last something like 20 microseconds. And if they last 20 microseconds, then we can say, well, this, uh, the time difference must be about a factor of 10, so you can figure out about how fast this muon has to be going. And they've done these tests with uh, muons created in laboratories, muons created in, uh, in when cosmic rays hit the upper atmosphere. Uh, but this has been tested and, and verified to within, within experimental accuracy that special relativity is right. Clocks actually run slower. And it's important to note that this idea that your clock is running slower, this isn't some kind of, uh, uh, this isn't some kind of optical illusion. I could synchronize this clock, this weird light clock, with any sort of mechanical clock or with the decay rate of, of, uh, of particles like the muon or with how fast 
uh, how fast I think or how much I age. And when I'm moving, those things will still be synchronized. I will age, I will appear to age slower if I'm moving at a, at a fast speed with respect to someone who's at rest. The other really weird thing about this is that we say that this clock appears to run faster than our moving clock. But if I was in the frame of reference of the moving clock, then it would be this clock that's at rest and this clock would be the one moving. So if I was moving with this clock, it wouldn't be that this clock's still running slow and this clock is running quickly. If I'm in the moving frame of reference, then it's actually this clock that's going to run at the normal, appear to run at the normal rate. And this clock is the one that's going to be slowed down. So there's some really, uh, really weird effects with this time dilation that occur and it's actually been experimentally measured uh, and, and verified to a very high degree of accuracy.